Peace, fam. It's Guido. Have you tried our applied coffee scrub method? It's exfoliating properties, send folding noise and antioxidants to attack those old ashy and dead skin cells and restores the true shine and moisturizes melanin back to its initial condition. Oh yeah, you see how good it suds up? That looks like those folanoids activating itself with the water in order to enter your skin as your skin acts as a strainer and the coffee scrub properties represent a stream of water working itself in and out through your pores, yet still being applied under the skin surface. Okay, so while I do this six or seven minute jump rope challenge, I need you all to time me to make sure I go all the way through because I want to speak a little on pre-colonial African history meanwhile. Let's go. One, two, three, go. Archaeologists in Arabic records give us differing versions of Ghana's government. From al Bakri, we learned that Ghana's capital had almost 15,000 inhabitants in 1100. The government was headed by a king who was feared and respected. Aside from being a diplomat, he was also a religious leader and the representative on earth of the founding ancestors of the Soninke people. Not merely a king himself, he ruled over kingdoms that had kings of their own. Archaeologists describe a far less structured government with much more local control, both Arabic and modern sources, though, agree that ruling kings came and went while local kings continued to govern their city-states. So long as they paid tribute, the local royalty le were left alone to carry on their traditional ways of life under their own laws and customs. al Bakri described the royal city as a self-contained compound where the king's numerous wives and children, counselors, court physicians, and artisans, household slaves, and personal guards lived in seclusion and security. The palace was built of stone and encircled by houses of the king's wives and children. Other buildings included storehouses, the treasury, and stables. The whole compound was surrounded by a wall that had parapets and towers from which bowmen and spear throwers could defend against attack. None of this has yet been confirmed. We know more about the king's rule. The king's authority was absolute. His word was first and final. He issued pardons, negotiated peace treaties, approved royal marriages, bestowed honors, and appointed governors. No one dared contradict or challenge him, at least not publicly, including his many wives. Behind the scenes, he relied upon a team of judges, governors, generals, and counselors to provide him with information so he could approve a trade agreement that would benefit the, the entire empire or handle a dispute between farmers. Not too much is known about women's role in the government. Although there was no ruling queen in Ghana, the wives of the kings were politically powerful. Some scholars suggest that the lineage of the king was traced through his mother. Mahmoud al Kati, a Muslim scholar and a Sonike, distinguished himself as a writer. His work was incorporated later in the Tarih, in the Tarih of Futash, a history of the Sudan by Ibn Mukhtar. Although it is impossible to be sure which parts of the work are drawn from al Kati's writings, Mukhtar's book is still a valuable resource for scholars. al Kati wrote specifically about the Ghanaian king named Kanisa'i, whose wealth rivaled that of the pharaohs of Egypt. Al-Bakri described the court of Tunka Menin 
who had succeeded his maternal uncle King Basi or Yuka Bas to the, to the throne between 1062 and 1067 CE. Behind the king stands 10 pages holding shields and swords decorated with gold, and on his right are the sons of subordinate kings, all wearing splendid garments with their hair mixed with gold. On the ground around him are seated his ministers. Wilkes, the governor of the city, seats before him. On guard at the door are dogs of fine pedigree, wearing collars of gold and silver adorned with knobs. Ghana's kings were commanders in chief of the army. One king boasted that he could fill 200,000 warriors in defense of his empire. This may not have been an idle threat because Ghana's military exploits were, were, were well documented by al Baki. Ghanaian soldiers were among the elite members of society, highly respected and well paid. More than likely, the regular army was made up of about a few thousand troops, mostly career soldiers, who were primarily responsible for keeping the empire's borders secure and crushing minor insurrections and revolts among the vassal states. Ghana's strength discouraged attacks, so the kingdom enjoyed lengthy periods of peace. But there were times when Ghana needed to expand or had to defend its territory. Whether or not it was the capital of Ghana, Kambi Sali was certainly an important city, and there is growing evidence that there were, there were other large trading centers on the Niger and Senegal rivers. By about AD 800, Jinni alone had about 20,000 inhabitants, archaeologists assure us. Most Soninke towns, though, had about 500 to 1,500 residents. These smaller towns were surrounded by walls with moats or pits in front of them. City dwellers wore expensive clothing, owning, owned objects of art, swords, copper utensils, foreign products, and ate exotic foods, especially citrus fruit, but a majority of the people didn't live that way. All right, fam. So in order to stay linked up into the discussion, you must become an Afro cultivator. So go ahead and hit the link in the description and then go to the button at the bottom that's highlighted and says, become an Afro cultivator now. Once you do that, you're going to have access to all discounts and all Afrocultural concepts before they go to the public. I appreciate you guys watching me take part in this jump rope challenge. Let me know if you think I made six minute the six minute marker or not. Peace.